with me over to 1 Timothy chapter 6 as we turn to the last chapter in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 6. <clears throat> One of the challenges I have each week is coming up with a title for my message. Um, what I do is I, I, I study the text, I prepare and so forth, and then as time goes on, I'm ever aware, okay, you have to have a title this week, so what are you going to come up with? So that usually changes as the week goes on. The original name of this message was Educated Beyond Their Intelligence. <laughs> but I decided there's more to the text than just that, although it's there. And I would have loved to leave it there, but that's my old nature probably. So uh, I decided to use the, the title, The Outworking of Our Faith. A good, true to the text, but somewhat generic uh, title. Um, nevertheless, I think it is a true one. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, we continue on here. Uh, chapter 6 is a continuation of chapter 5, obviously with important but distinct instructions. Now, let me say this. Let me say this. Important to understand this. If you're new to Christianity, if you're new to the Bible, remember there are no real numbered chapter divisions in the Bible, nor are there actual verse numbers. Those were added much later on. Now, I'm glad they're there usually, but sometimes those chapter divisions can kind of uh, interrupt the flow of the passage. Understand these are like 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Romans, 1 Corinthians, etc. These were letters written to churches. Okay, Paul didn't write to me. He says, okay now, chapter 1, verse 1. That's not the way it was. It was, a, it was a letter. And if you notice the beginning of them and the end of them, it's very obvious that that was what they were or what they are, are letters. So chapter 6 is a continuation of chapter 5 with some distinctions. Chapter 5 dealt with how to treat each person in the church from older men, younger men, older women, younger women, uh, to widows, uh, women with no family at all, uh, to pastors, those in leadership, how they should be treated, how they should be supported, to pastors who fail to live up to the biblical standards that are there. How are we supposed to deal with those people? Lots of nuggets, sections of helpful things to build the local church ministry to be what it's supposed to be. That's, that's the way it's written. And if you see it written that way, you can see the value in learning how to do a church through the pages of what we have in Scripture. And so that's very, very important. Now, I find it fascinating that a book that was written and compiled over 1,500 years, think about that, speaks to us about specifics that we are facing in the days in which we live. See, folks, Christianity is, is not meant to be simply a bunch of facts in a book that we learn. Okay? It's not like learning English grammar. These truths that we learn in the Bible are to be lived out. There's a reason God gave them to us, okay? It's, it's, and, and listen, I, I, am, I believe in reading the Bible through in a year or two years or three years or whatever, or if you don't like to do it that way, just being in the Word of God every day. We should be in the Word of God every day. But it's not just a check mark on our to-do list. We can't act upon the truth of God if we don't learn the Word of God. So we have to learn it first. But it doesn't stop with learning. God expects us now to respond to it. And that is what brings transformation to a life. These truths are to be lived out. Not only that, we also, from the Scriptures, we know the future of what's going to be coming through the prophetic word of God. Roughly one-third of the Bible, almost one-third of the Bible is prophetic. Did you know that? Almost one-third of it. Now, there are a lot of churches today. We have some in, church, in St. Cloud 
who people, people have come here and then they've gone, they visited here for some reason, they've gone back to their church, we've spoken on some prophetic theme or the rapture of the church or the coming tribulation, we've got many series, we've done the book of Revelation verse by verse twice, um, and they'll go back to their church and they'll talk to their pastor and say, why don't we ever study prophecy? Well, we don't do that here. You know, sometimes it's a term like, it's too divisive. Or, well, we don't believe, you know, like uh, we're not into this rapture stuff and all that. Well, let me tell you this. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you'll be into the rapture one of these days. <laughs> you're going whether you believe it or not. You're going to go up. But we have an amazing book, and it is important for us to learn it. Now, in verse 1, it says this. Let as many servants as are under the yoke be counted, or excuse me, count their own masters worthy of all honor, next phrase, that the, that the name of God and his doctrine, his teaching, be not blasphemed. All right? Now, I'll get back to that, but that's an important line to remember. You might want to underline that. All right? We're going to go through, and, and again, we've got six things in the text that we're covering today to touch on, so uh, let's go through it. The first one we see in verse 1, God has ordained that the servant is to honor and be obedient to his master. Now, the instruction here in chapter 6 is for the slave who is a believer. Slavery was all over the world at the time that Paul wrote this. Slavery was also an accepted part of society when Paul wrote this. He's not, uh, he's not addressing this to address the whole issue of is it right, is it wrong, or whatever. No, this is the way life was. And there were believers in Jesus Christ who were owned by people, owned by, quote unquote, okay, you, you understand what I'm saying, um, and what was their responsibility to the one who, quote-unquote, owned them or the one that they worked for? Well, this is, a, um, this is a, an issue of submission to authority, and we covered that in detail when we were in Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 1 here is speaking of the believing slave who had an unbelieving master. Now, let me say this. There was certainly... Uh, slavery and abuse of slavery and treachery and misery at the time, but not all setups were that way. There were masters who treated their slaves properly, kindly, as a matter of fact. As a matter of fact, some, some slaves, even when they were able to go free, they decided, I don't want to go free. I love my master, and, and they, were, they would be called a bond slave, and they would actually take their ear and put them on a block of wood, and they would take an awl, and they would hammer it through, okay? And, and basically, it was, a, it was a mark of ownership. That slave willingly said, I want to be owned by my master. I love my master, Okay? Isn't that interesting? By the way, when the Bible talks about Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, that's that word. That's that word. A love slave. A love slave, okay? Now, again, we have to understand it. We're not talking about, when we talk about the cruelties of the slavery in, the, in, you know, uh, in past centuries, we're not talking about that. We are talking about Bible here. Now, while we do not have this arrangement in America today, as far as we know, and if it's there, it's illegal as far as a, an abusive slavery situation, while we do not have this arrangement in America, it is better to see this for us today as an employee-employer relationship. Okay? Take the principles and apply it to the employee-employer relationship. Nevertheless, the instructions are a far cry uh, from what do we do today when, uh, when you work for a boss and you don't like the way he treats you? Well, nowadays what we think is, okay, the answer to that is to go on strike. Let's everybody mount a rebellion towards the boss. Okay, well, that is not, by the way, can I be so bold as to say today, that is not God's way of solving the issue? It is not God's way. You don't see that anywhere in Scripture. 
Ephesians chapter 6, and I'll just read that passage from Ephesians. It says in verse 5, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, not with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto, uh, but in, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not unto men. So if you work for somebody, work, work for them for Christ. In other words, they're not perfect. You know they're not perfect. They know you're not perfect, even though you may think you are. But none of us are perfect. And therefore, all that we do as Christians is to be done to the glory of God. And if I am doing my job, not so much for my boss, but for my Lord in heaven, my Father, that makes all the difference in the world. And that will bring a consistency and a stability and a quality to the job that I do. I do what I do for Jesus. I don't do it if my employer just, I don't do it because my employer just gave me a, a raise. Okay? Verse 2, back to 1 Timothy 6, verse 2. And they that have believing masters, in other words, your master who's over you as a slave back then, he's a believer. Now, get the picture. First, he addresses slaves or servants who are believers who work for whoever, their masters. Now he addresses those and I, I just find this kind of stuff fascinating. Now he addresses those who are working for believing masters. In other words, you as a slave, you're a believer, but your master, your boss, is also a believer. You might say, why would it address that? Well, it's important, folks, because God is looking for biblical consistency. In our lives. And in verse 2, it says, And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. Evidently, there must have been some sort of, I would imagine, friction going on, some sort of conflict be between believing masters who had slaves who were believers. And so there may have, might have been some tension. Now, Timothy, we believe, was the pastor of the church at Ephesus. And so this may have been going on in the Ephesian body. All right? So we see our first point was this. God has ordained that, serve, that the servant is to honor and be obedient to his master. But secondly, those who work for a believer should be sure to render faithful service. You see that in verse 2. Let me say it again. Those who work for a believer should be sure to render faithful service. Can I mention this? Particularly if you work for a believer who's part of your local church. Ah, now we're getting a little, little bit of, little bit of uh, issue can come up in this. Now, why is this important? Well, because, listen, they are part of the family of God and share in the fellowship and blessings of the family of God, just like you do. See, there may be the employer-employee relationship, master-slave, whatever you want to put, but when it all comes down to it, if we have trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, we are all the children of God. And we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, I find it interesting that as we went from uh, doctrinal issues in chapter 4 and we turned the page into chapter 5, do you remember? Okay, here's how you treat older men, here's how you treat older women, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is just a continuation of that. How we treat each other in the body. Hold your place here and turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Uh, can, I, can I mention to this, folks? And the Bible could not be more clear. There should be no conflicts like this in the local church. 
These things should be beneath us. What there should be in the local church, there should be such love and harmony for one another to where when unbelievers walk in, they're, they're, they're blown away by an atmosphere of love and caring. Did not Jesus say, they'll know you're my disciples by the love that you have one for another? Isn't that interesting? Not conflict, love. Galatians chapter 3 tells us this. It says, for you are all the children of God. How? By faith in Christ Jesus. Not by religion, not by denomination, by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now, this is not talking about water baptism. This is talking about becoming part of the body of Christ, being baptized into the body of Christ. The moment you put your faith in Christ. Verse 28, watch this now. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither, cross-reference 1 Timothy 6, 1 and 2. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. True biblical equality. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. So if that is true, then why should there be conflict? Well, there really shouldn't be. If we are putting others before ourselves, if we're loving one another, as God's word tells us to. You see, while positionally we are all the same in Christ, it is not the same on a practical or even vocational basis. We are still under authority to those God has put over us, and we need to uh, respect those principles and obey those principles and, and uh, live the godly Christian life within that ap application, okay? Now, I find it interesting, going back to 1 Timothy 6, verse 2. This is fascinating, and I remember the first time I saw this in life, and then later I read it in the Bible, and I thought, I remember seeing this problem before. Well, here it is. 1 Timothy 6. See, here's what was going on in verse 2. You notice... And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service. In other words, don't, don't look at them with disdain. If you work for a believer and that believer, you're employed by them and that believer wants you to do something, maybe it's something you don't want to do, how do you view that person? Do you have negative feelings towards them? Do you go complain to other people about them? God says don't. Why? Well, do them service. Do what you're supposed to do because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. Some believers, and here's what happens today at times, folks. Some believers think that if they work for another believer, they can do less. And take advantage and even loaf at times because, hey, after all, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. God says, no, no. He's a Christian. He's an understanding man. Okay? Let's say you're calling in sick all the time and you're really not, but you just want to have some extra time to do this or that. And then your boss, who's a believer, has you come in and say, hey, you know, I'm concerned about this or that. And you get kind of offended and agitated by it. Well, you know what? We're brothers and sisters in Christ. They ought to know better. Well, I'm, I'm offended that they would think, of, no, wait a minute. They didn't do the wrong thing. You did. That shouldn't be going on. Let me ask you this. Would you do that to an unbeliever? Let me put it another way. Would you try that with an unbelieving boss? Probably not. But they're believers. Oh, they're gracious. They're merciful. They'll understand. Folks, we are never to cut corners or slough off. We are never to waste time. 
When we waste time where we work, we are stealing from them. They did not hire us for us to waste time. Even if they're a fellow believer and even if we go to the same church. Galatians 6, look at it with me. Galatians 6 and verse 10. Well, I know we have a policy, but hey, we're brothers and sisters in the Lord, and I'm sure they'll make an exception for me. Do you understand how difficult that makes it on the employer when people come with special favors because you're in the same church or because you're in the body together? Don't, let's not do that. Let's not do that. Okay? Don't put them in that predicament. Galatians 6.10, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Let's do good unto all. If we have opportunity, let us do good to everybody, especially those who are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let me give you a, a, a principle here, all right? Believers should outwork unbelievers. Okay? Believers should outwork unbelievers. When we fail to live as we should as believers, it causes unbelievers to doubt the reality of our God and the truth of His Word. And as a result of that, you know what they do? They speak against God and against the Word of God. We say we're believers. We say we're Christians, okay? Well, the world understands in their mind how Christians should live. Did you know that? By the way, that's one of the things that frustrates them the most. Okay, okay, okay. You've made it clear. You're a Christian. You're trying to get me to be saved or to accept Jesus or to... Uh, believe the Bible and all of this. But hey, when I look at your life, I don't see anything different there than what I have in mine. And in their mind, it's a bunch of hypocritical, phony baloney. That's the way they think. And they get turned off. And I get it. That's not the answer, but I get it. Yeah, they're turned off. But folks, can I put it this way? Our responsibility is to get them turned on, to receive Christ, to see the reality of the Word of God and the God of the Word in our lives and how we live and what we say, both, of, both our talk and our walk, both of them. If I talk about how much I love the Lord and how great He is and what a Savior He is and, and how He's my answer and my everything and all this, and if I don't live like that... If I'm always saying that and I don't live that way, people are going to look at me and say, they're weirdos. They're religious fanatics. I don't want to have any part of this. Okay? Now let's take that and let's back it up and let's bring it back to our context here. The importance of us being the best we can be at our jobs. I can remember when I worked at public supermarket, uh, when I went to Florida Bible College, uh, during, somewhere during the first year, I transferred to Publix. I was working at another grocery store. I transferred to Publix. And I started working there. And, and when I went to apply at this one, that was, it was the closest public supermarket to the college, they weren't too keen on hiring another Florida Bible College student. Now, that's bad news. I can think of one girl in particular who was a student. Now, I don't know if she graduated or not, but when I got there, boy, she was kind of the talk. She, she had an attitude, and she was just not godly at all in the way she conducted herself, and she was a problem. She was a problem with the lost employees, okay? And they weren't too keen about hiring another one, but for whatever reason, I'll take it, it was God's will, he allowed me to get a job there, and then they hired a few more of us. And I can remember at times talking to my fellow 
FBC student employees and saying, guys, you know, this is our mission field. God's given this place the mission field. We need to be sure that we are living godly testimonies, that we're doing the best we can and be faithful with the gospel, but they need to see reality. Uh, they don't have a good view of us. We need to get that turned around. Well, in time, it did turn around. As a matter of fact, a couple years down the road, they'd gotten another manager in. Long story short, he ended up trusting Christ the Savior. But it was because of the influence, of the, the positive influence of the Florida Bible College students at that place of employment. What, what am I saying, folks? Here's what I'm saying. We should outwork unbelievers. And let me get radical here today. If you work for a, an employer and you, let's say you, now I know this isn't usually the case, but maybe it is, depending on the job you do, you run out of work one day. You're caught up, you're diligent, you run out of work, okay? Let me challenge you. You're going to think I'm crazy. Hopefully not. Okay, let's say I am. Let's move on from that. <laughs> Here's what you do. You ready? You go to your boss and say, I'm all done with what you wanted me to do. What else would you like me to do? What? That's not, not my job description. Wait a minute. Your job description is to live heartily unto the Lord, not unto men. Right? Isn't that what we're supposed to do as Christians? And so after you resuscitate your boss from off the floor, <laughs> maybe he'll have something else for you to do. Folks, let me tell you something. Those are the people that become very, very valuable employees. They're not stabbing the, the boss in the back. They're not gossiping about the boss. They're not rallying with the labor union to strike against this guy who gave them the job to begin with. They're thinking, what can I do to be the best I can be with my job. That's the mindset a Christian should have. Okay? Third point is this. The name of God and his doctrine should not be blasphemed. Do you see that in verse 1? Us living the way we should as believers, one of the reasons is so God's word does not get blasphemed. When we fail to live as we should, it causes unbelievers to doubt the reality of our God and the truth of his word. Okay? Now, there are many strong admonitions in Scripture for those of us who are believers to live like believers should, all right? If you want to turn to these, you can. Otherwise, you can see them on the screen. I'm going to quote them. Uh, a bunch of them are from Titus, so if you can get over to Titus quickly, you'll see them quickly. Titus chapter 2. Titus is a pastoral epistle. Titus was written by Paul to Titus, he was left on the Isle of Crete. He was there to organize the churches and ordain elders in those local churches that were there. Now, we know salvation is the gift of God. It's not of works. We'll get to that in just a minute. But how should believers, those of us who have trusted Christ, how should we live? Here's Paul's instructions to Titus. Titus 2, verse 7, it says, "...in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works." In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, and then it goes on. Look down to verse 14. Who gave himself for us, referring to Jesus, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, look at this, zealous of good works. Now, peculiar in the Bible doesn't mean you're a weirdo. It means you're unique. You stand out. Okay? You're special. Chapter 3, verse 8, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Jump down to verse 14, 314. And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. All right? Now, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, and I want you to see it here because uh, we see the order of how things should be in the life of a person. We are not saved by good works. 
Now, I know we've just covered a lot of verses having to do with good works, but good works don't get you to heaven. Rather, good works are what God wants His children to have in their lives once they've trusted Christ as Savior. So we're not saved by good works. We're not kept by good works. You don't prove you're saved by good works, because how many would that take? No one knows. No, but we've been saved unto good works. God has saved us, and He wants our lives to show the world the reality of him. It says in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Do you see that? That's how you're saved, by grace through faith. Faith in what? Just faith in God? Oh, I have faith in God. No, that doesn't save it's faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross, okay? Let me, let me explain this to you. Perhaps you've never seen it before. This hand represented you and me, both of us, all of us. Let my wallet represent the things we do wrong. God calls them sin, sins. We're all sinners, every one of us. Yet God loves us. He hates our sin. Our sin separates us from him. You cannot get to heaven with even one sin. And we are sinners. We have sin. Now, the Bible says, Revelation, there shall in no way enter into it anything that defiles or works in abomination or even makes a lie. So sin keeps you out of heaven. Not only that, but if you die with your sin, without a payment, you would have to die and spend forever in a literal hell where there's no rest day nor night forever. God doesn't want that for you, and he doesn't want it for me. Now, religion gets it mixed up. They say, okay, you're, you, you've got to have good works to go to heaven. No, good works won't save you. If, if we're sinners, the problem is the sin has to be gone. Do we get that? If we're sinners, no amount of good works will pay for sin. Death is the only payment for sin, the wages of sin being death. If the pages of my Bible were a whole lifetime of good works, you can put those there. Well, look what all the things I've done. Wait a minute. The sin's still there. Good works don't take it away. Death is the only payment for sin. If we die to pay for our sin, we'll be suffering for it forever in hell. God says this, no, I love you so much. I hate your sin. I will come myself, I will send my son, God the Son, Jesus Christ, to come and be your payment. And that is exactly what God did. This hand representing Jesus Christ, you notice he had no sin of his own because he's God. Came to earth, lived a perfect life. When he went to the cross, the sin of your entire life, past, present, and future, Jesus took it upon himself and he made the payment so you don't have to make the payment. He did it for you. If he paid for all of it, how much is left? Nothing. He was buried. He came back from the dead. And he says, if you will put your faith in him, if you'll believe in him that he did that for you, he will give you, the moment you do that, everlasting life. Everlasting. Like, wait a minute. All I have to do is, is believe in him that he did that for me? Yes. That's it. That's what the Bible says. You notice it says in verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. See, it's a gift. You can't earn it. If you could earn it by good works, it wouldn't be a gift. You'd have to earn it. No, it's a gift. Verse 9, it's not of works. Not of works. Not of works. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. It's funny, you show some people these verses, and they'll look at it, and they'll say, and they'll say well, that's not what it means. Okay, you tell me what it means. Well, all I know is that's not what it means. The blindness, the blindness. For by grace are you saved. Grace is God's unmerited kindness towards us. For by grace are you saved through faith. Faith is believing. Okay. Believing what? You're believing in Jesus Christ that he's paid for all your sins. And when you do, he gives you everlasting life. That's what verses 8 and 9 is talking about. Now, verse 10, it says, For we are his workmanship. The, the, 
It's an interesting word, workmanship. The thing that is made. It's, it's like somebody creating a, a, a rug or a quilt is the idea. Poema is the word. The product, the thing that is made. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto, not by, but unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we, notice the next word, should walk in them. It doesn't say we will walk in them. It, says, it doesn't say we must walk in them. It says we should walk in them. Why? Because should is the only thing that would go along with the fact that salvation is a gift. If I have to do it, then it's not a gift. It's a contract. Okay? If I will do it, how many is enough? to prove that I do it. And what happens if you have opportunity and you miss the opportunity? That's a sin, according to James. No, we should do it. And so the Christian should live a godly life. Now let's go back to 1 Timothy 6, and it says in verse 3, and this is where this kind of turns the corner here, which will bring us to our fourth point today, and it is this. It's a warning about false teachers. Don't you find it fascinating as we study the Bible verse by verse how many passages and books deal with false doctrine and false teachers? How often do you hear that? You hardly ever hear that. Preachers are afraid to say that because they're, 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 they're quote-unquote, being negative. Or, you know, when people can't find the right word, they say he's a legalist. These people are just like the left. They can't win an argument, so they call you names. No. The Bible tells us there are false teachers. There were false teachers then. There are false teachers today. 1 Timothy 6.3, if any man teach otherwise, otherwise, what do you mean? Contrary to what I've been saying, Paul is saying, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine, which is according to godliness, teaching that leads to godlikeness, literally, us becoming godly. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, I look at the next few verses and I say, yeah, you know what? There was a scrappy side to the Apostle Paul. Under inspiration, he says, if anybody doesn't agree with what I've been telling you, because what he was telling us is inspired of God, he says, if they disagree, he's proud, doesn't know anything, but doting about questions and strifes of word where... Whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmising, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth. They don't have the truth. Supposing that gain is godliness from such, withdraw thyself. Now let's unpack this a little bit. If anyone teaches contrary to the word of God, contrary to what we've been seeing, he's proud. We know what that means. He doesn't know anything. He's an ignoramus. They may think they know, but they really don't know. Doting about questions. Isn't that interesting? Okay. You notice here the warning about false teachers. Notice that those who teach contrary to the scriptures are simply simply put, they're ignorant and they don't know anything. That's what Paul says. They're ignorant. You know, as time goes on, folks, and the internet continues to grow and grow and grow, and more people are posting videos up on the internet, you better be careful who you're watching and who you're listening to. Okay? Get back to the Word. Get back to the Word. Now, what what Paul says about them in verse 4, it sounds rude unless it's true. And it is true. Think about it. If they're teaching contrary to the Bible, they're arguing with God himself. What arrogance. No wonder he says they're proud. Don't put question marks where God puts periods. 
The wise man adjusts himself to the Bible. The foolish man adjusts the Bible to himself. By the way, that's why you have to keep having another translation after another translation after another translation. Okay? Well, how can we make this to where it becomes popular? Not to mention there's plenty of money involved in this. Okay, verse 4 again. Doting about questions. They are obsessed or infected. Doting about questions and strifes of word. They're, they're obsessed or infected with questions and they're trying to show how smart they are. Have you ever run into one? They're full of information but are greatly lacking godly action. Now people on the internet can master this because they can learn how to produce and post things but you have no idea how they're living their life. You have no idea. Well, I just leave that up to God. Well, I don't think we have a choice on that, do you? But you see, folks, that's one of the protections and the beauties and the safety net features of the local church. We have accountability here. We have accountability. They're full of information, but are greatly lacking godly action. This is the person who will not simply believe God and what he says and do it. They believe and teach against the clear uh, teaching of the scriptures. And the more followers they can get, the more influence they can have, the better because they're using that for their own purposes. You notice what it says? Their minds are corrupt. Men of corrupt minds, verse 5. They are in it to impress people and gain a following, and sometimes they're in it so that they can get financial support. Did you know, folks, that you can set up and, uh, you, can set up and you can use something like YouTube? You can make a living on YouTube videos. Did you know that? Those aren't just out there and they just sit there. There are people who actually make a life on YouTube videos. Now, I'm not saying that's bad in itself, but false teachers, what a vehicle. No accountability. Say what you want. Get people to believe it so they give you money, and you're making money on stuff you're not even sure you believe, but you know how to spin it. I know, maybe somebody's saying, well, you're just the ray of sunshine, aren't you? <laughs> I wouldn't be preaching this if it wasn't here. I'd be preaching something else today. But this is the text. Aren't you glad? Amen. By the way, Peter warned about the same types of false teachers. It wasn't just Paul. Peter said in 2 Peter 2, verse 1, he said, but there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily or privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, and by reason of whom the way of the truth shall be evil spoken of. I have found over the years... that they often have an argument as to why it doesn't really mean what it says. People love to do that. You show them the Bible, it doesn't mean what it says. Okay? What do you, don't you know how to read? We've, in the last year and a half, been, been uh, attacked by some on the Internet saying we're legalists and we're this and we're that and, and you know, we're, we're uh, preaching a false gospel. Can you imagine that one? Okay? And I've come up with a name for these people, okay? They're, they're members of BITE, BITE, B-I-I-T, B-I-I-T, okay? Biblically illiterate internet theologians, BITE. <laughs> Biblically illiterate. Now, why do I say that? Am I, why am I being so harsh? I'm not really trying to be harsh, but folks, listen. If you can't read the Bible... And just believe what it says and do what it says. You're biblically illiterate. You can't understand it. There's something wrong. You need to go back and learn how to read. 
The scriptures are so clear as to what they're saying. This is not complicated. And God says, be careful of these people. They think that they have some superior knowledge and exclusive understanding of spiritual issues, but they don't. One of the greatest theologians I've ever known, Dr. Mark G. Cameron, I was under his teaching when I was at Florida Bible College. <laughs> How's this for deep? Oh, people hate this. He said, when common sense makes good sense, seek no other sense. When common sense makes good sense, seek no other sense. Well, that doesn't sound very spiritual to me. In light of Scripture, it's very spiritual. You believe what it says, you do what it says. Right? A lot of people don't want that today. Oh, they've got some deeper understanding. Everybody's wrong. We're the only ones who get it. Avoid them our fifth point is this, true spirituality leads to a godly, fruitful life. Folks, if we are walking in fellowship with Christ, which will always be according to the Word of God, we will become more like Him in character as time goes on. We will manifest the fruit of the Spirit. This is godliness or God-likeness. Jesus said in John 15, he said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If you're walking with Christ in fellowship with him, yielded, obedient to him, you'll bear fruit as a Christian. Verse 3 talks about wholesome words, which means sound or healthy words. What does that do? Healthy words words produce healthy Christians. All right? Titus talked about it. Paul talked about it to Titus. He says, Titus 2.1, he said, speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. One more thing, and we'll close. We find it in verse 5. It says, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. We'll say more about this next week or next time I'm here. But the sixth point, the last point is this. Withdraw thyself from these types of people. Don't keep listening to them. Don't give them the time of day. People who take the word of God and twist it and say, well, it doesn't mean what it says. Okay? Well, I know what it says, but it doesn't mean what it says. Are you still going to follow somebody like that? Get away from them. Okay? Withdraw thyself. Romans 16, 17 says we are to mark them and we are to avoid them. Romans 16, 18 says, For they are, that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches they deceive the hearts of the simple those who don't know any better. There are deceivers roaming the planet today, folks. Be careful of them. Be careful of them. Now listen, good people can get off as well. People who are once sound and then they get off doctrinally. We've been covering, haven't we, in the last few, our loyalty is where? Number one, it's to the Word of God. It's where it needs to be. That not only keeps us from getting off track, it also keeps us from... Uh, uh, getting twisted as a church and distorted as a church. It's always Christ in the Word of God. Always Christ in the Word of God. Okay? Let me close with this in John chapter 3, verse 36. Perhaps you're here today and you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior. What does God say? God says this. He wants you to be His child. And all He's asking you to do is put your faith in Jesus Christ that He's paid for all your sins. You're trusting in Him to save you. You're trusting in Him as your Savior. John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son of God shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. What does a person have to do to end up being separated from God for all eternity? Nothing. Nothing. Unbelievers are under the wrath of God. The only way you can get out from under it is to put your faith in Jesus Christ. 
Let's all bow in prayer, shall we, today? With every head bowed and every eye closed, please, no one looking around, perhaps you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ yourself as your Savior, okay? You've never put your faith in Him and Him alone as your Savior, friend. God loves you and He wants you to be His child. Would you right now trust in Jesus Christ to get you to heaven right where you sit? Those of you watching online, you put your faith in Jesus Christ right where you sit. There's no formal prayer. You can talk to the Lord if you want. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying this. Will you right now believe, will you trust in Jesus Christ that he has paid for all your sins? Will you believe that? You're trusting in him to save you. He's your savior. Would you trust in him? Now, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the moment you do, he gives you everlasting life. And you are secure for all eternity. You can never be lost again. Now, if you're here today and you've, first time you've understood it is today, could I pray for you? I won't embarrass you in any way, and you don't have to do this, but I'd like to pray for you if you just slip up your hand. And in that, you're indicating to me that you understood it today, and today you trusted Christ as Savior. Raising your hand won't get you to heaven. That's just for prayer. And I won't embarrass you, but with heads bowed and eyes closed, is there anyone who could say, Yes, today I understood this. Today I trusted Christ as my Savior. Would you pray for me? Is there anyone? Would you pray for me? Today I trusted Christ. Would you pray for me? Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for your wonderful truth. Uh, Lord, these are very important days in which we live, very serious days. There is much apostasy going on. There's much rebellion to your word. I pray that we as believers would be humble, obedient, sweet people, that we would walk in love as you have loved us. But yet, Father, we would be, as, as one man described Paul, a tender-hearted, compassionate soul winner who's unbending on theology. Yes, Lord, that's what you'd have for all of us to be tender-hearted, compassionate, but unbending on your truth. Help us, Father, to be that. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening. And would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.